my name is Jack Gates. <clears throat> and uh, I guess the one thing that's most explanatory of what I've been doing for the last 49 years, I've been working in services to adults with intellectual disabilities. But actually, the last 45 of that, I can hardly take credit for working with people because I've been uh, doing staff training. But branching off of staff training, something which not is not training at all, actually, but which uh, a few of us in Southeastern Mass and some other people around the country and in Canada pioneered 40 years ago already, is uh, person-centered planning. The phrase that I use for just the way that I like to do person-centered planning is uh, a design session. Um, Bryce was a young man in his teens. We did a design session on behalf of Bryce. Bryce and his family and lots of other people. Okay, and so, yeah, it's a good thing to pay attention to who is Bryce, that, that's central person centered, right? But a design session, there are gonna be some people that we hope will come to help think together about Bryce's future, who maybe some of them are people who hate meetings. Let's see what we can do to kind of informalize in a, a few different ways, including in the name of it, so design session. So the word meeting, so person-centered planning of anybody's format, okay, what, what, what's it about? I think one way that I sum it up kind of more informally, you know, non-bureaucratic sounding, is that uh, we're gonna think it through out loud together. So thinking it through, not just the first thing that comes to somebody, thinking it through out loud, because then together people can build on each other's ideas and critique each other's ideas. So the last stage of what I talk about will be the composition of the group. What are some good options there? Whom should be invited, ideally? Okay. But before that, I'll talk about some of the kind of the pieces, some of the, some of the big questions that I've found to be the most valuable, okay, over the years. When we've got a band of people, when we've got someplace between five and 30 people, all of whom know Bryce and get together and we'll think about his future. Okay. So different elements, different pieces, different steps. Okay. And the first thing to say though, is that person-centered planning, design session, graphic design, a uh, process called PATH, I've forgotten what that stands for, that the folks in Toronto use. And that's a big production. You wanna get between five and 30 people, and I don't know if I think 30 is ideal, but you wanna especially get you know enough people to really get lots of ideas popping, brainstorming, proposals, right? And so to get, you know, maybe ideally something like eight, 10, 12, 14 people together in a room, for a total of maybe about the way I like to do it anyway, that for five or six hours, that may be consecutive or it may be broken into two or three or four meetings, but still, how are you gonna get all those people in one room together? It's a big production. Oh, it's worth doing. And you know, people will tell me that it's, it's me, uh, but, um, but it, it's, it's a challenge, okay? But one thing that I think, and we have a little bit of experience with this, that any one of these questions that I'll tell you, any one of these steps is actually probably worth doing just even on its own, if that's all you can pull together. And even worth doing, even if you can't get all the ideal people there who care about Bryce, they'd be things worth pondering, thinking out loud together about even just one of those questions, if you got, four or five people who know Bryce just for an hour. Or if you got, even if you don't have family and friends, that, that even if it's only staff, that's okay. Most of my best friends are staff. You guys are staff, right? So even if it were, let's say at a staff meeting, Katie's a supervisor, she could use these. I hope she has maybe. Um, that uh, just to say, okay, let's together look at one person that we support and think about this question. Think out loud, reflect. 
So I hope the usefulness of what I'm saying uh, is not just, ooh, ooh, we're gonna do person-centered planning, let's schedule six hours with all the right people. Yeah, that's a good thing to do, but even short of that, you know, trying out little pieces of it in kind of reflective kinds of ways, right? People to stop and ponder and then share that. So first question, And this is in the sequence if you were doing it all in the multi-hour version, okay? Uh, but any one of these questions could be broken off, I think, okay? First question that I'd like to ask people is, uh, what brings out the best in Bryce? So here we've got, Bryce's was the extreme, actually. We had over 30 people in the room. That's kind of crazy, but uh, okay. We may not be able to hear from everybody, but people know Bryce from different angles, you see. There are people there from his school. He was a teenager in high school. Okay. There were, of course, his mother and his father. There were friends of the family. Wow, that's great. I always get that. And there were staff who knew him in different ways, a speech therapist. Okay. And it's not that they bring a different expertise, although, yeah, they might, but they bring different perspectives. Think of that literally, a perspective, like visually, right? Here's Bryce in the middle. Some people see him from this angle, some people from that angle. They see different things, even though it's the same guy. And that's valuable. We want to share that. And so the, the biggest single chunk uh, sometimes in a session would be inviting people to think out loud for over an hour about that question. What brings out the best in Bryce? What kinds of situations? What contexts? Very broad word, right? Uh, what kinds of physical environments even? Noisy or loud? Hey, people differ in that, don't they? I mean, there's just a little concrete example. Think about people you know. Not just people you support in services, people you know, anybody, you, your family, that there are some people are, it, it just, they really shine. It really brings out their best to be in a really quiet kind of atmosphere. Maybe just a couple of people or a few people. No background music, no televisions. It, it brings out their best. Other people, they'll shine really um, in a situation that's like boisterous and, and exciting and loud and like a festival. And then translate that if I'm a direct support worker, let's say in a group home or a day program, there are some of the people I support by thinking about that and putting other people's experiences together on that. There's some people that I'm gonna say, hey, when is the next uh, parade or festival or water fire in Providence? I mean, most of you work not far from there. Big, exciting, thousands of people, loud. Some people, you would be crazy to bring them there. They would just like <laughs> fall apart. Well, people are different. And there's no better way in that, but, but we gotta pay attention to that. If we're gonna support Bryce to the best life for him in the future, then we've gotta think about what brings out the best in Bryce and what brings out the worst in Bryce. We gotta talk out loud about that too. Sorry, Bryce. And when I'm the conductor, I'll do a couple of times that I'll sort of smile and, and apologize to Bryce because it's a little funny to talk about somebody in front of them, but we need to pay attention to these things, right? That, uh, and that's a very concrete example, noisy or loud. There are others that are subtler, right? But share everybody's experience. What brings out the best in Bryce? What kind of people bring out the best in Bryce? There's some people who learn more, develop better, act more nicely and, and helpfully uh, when they're mostly with women or mostly with men. Some people, it doesn't make a difference. Well, important to know, right? Because what's the whole idea here, design session, we're, we're designing a context that will surround Bryce. We're not designing how Bryce's mind is gonna work or his body's gonna work, we can't change that. We are designing what situations will bring out the best working of the Bryce's body and mind and, and, and emotions, right? What kind of people 
bring out the best? What kinds of tones of voice bring out the best? I mean, when I first ask that, I'm hearing myself say this, well, a nice tone of voice. Isn't that true for everybody? No, people are different. That some people, it will bring out their best to sort of give a, a firm instruction, kind of right, authoritative, and to say, well, first do this, and then this, and then this. Go get them, Bryce. Other people, you want to do it more indirectly, more softly, more cajoling, right? And not like firm. Or people, again, what kind of people? But some people uh, it might vary from one task to another, but, but even generally, there's some people who, if they're going to really accomplish much, the best way to do it is to make it clear what they need to do, and then they're going to do it solo. There are other people who will never accomplish anything unless they're part of a team. I think that's true of lots of people that I've met, including some people whom we support. Right? It's going to work much better that way. All these kind of uh, variables. And all of these, and the, the reason for having lots of perspectives there, this is an empirical question. This is not like a moral question or something. This is very empirical. Let's get all the people who know Bryce well. They have seen him in different situations and we're asking them to sort of weigh, balance and, and, and judge. What situations bring out the best in price? Good, never another example of that. And, and I have to say this, I've worked in human services long enough that, I, that sometimes I'm afraid I kind of badmouth some tendencies that uh, we tend toward in human service land, you might say broadly, in my experience anyway. One of them is, is an assessment mentality, assessment, right? Um, and so there are some people who, you know, it's their main job is assessing, let's say for instance, intelligence, right? There are some brilliant and devoted people, good people who have devoted whole careers to improving the assessment of intelligence, to make it more culture fair, to make it more, uh, you know, valid to, to, to future tasks that intelligence is called for, which is all tasks, I think, some kind of intelligence, but, uh, and to make it more, I forgot what the word is, but uh, there are different types of intelligence, right? Well, whatever intelligence is, we don't need to define it, but we human beings, we're at least in the 20th and 21st centuries, we're fascinated, and I think they were at least back to Plato, by the assessment question, how intelligent is Jeffrey? People who know Jeffrey, they have opinions about that. They haven't told you, Jeffrey, but the, it's it's fascinating question, really, the assessment question. How much of this good quality does Jeffrey have? Or Bryce, or you, or me, right? A fascinating question, but I think it's totally useless when it comes to planning the best life situation for Bryce. Because everybody, has not only are more intelligent in some places in life than others, multiple intelligences is the, the phrase I was going for that I've forgotten his name. Somebody Gardner wrote about Martin Gardner, maybe wrote about that 40 years ago. And it, it's, you know, you don't have to read an article about it. If you look around at anybody, there are some things that uh, you or me, as well as Bryce, is going to be smart about. It's going to grasp, right? There are other things, not so much. Right? I mean, that's why there are, even on the, the SAT has two big halves, right? And there are a lot of people, probably most people are noticeably better at the verbal side or the math and spatial side, right? Some people the other way around. That's important to know. If we're going to create the situation that brings out the best in Bryce, it is what is Bryce smart about? What brings out the intelligent side of Bryce? Because whether somebody's overall IQ is 12 or 190, they're still going to be more smart about some things than others. And if we're going to support them to have the best life situation we can, then we want to pay attention to that and put them in the situation more often that brings out their smarts. I mean, even when I worked, you know, decades ago at, at Dever State School. And there would be, you know, staff whom some of us would look back and say, well, they were kind of, you know, not so 
uh, sharp about the way that things ought to be back at the institution. But uh, but you know what? I, I fifty times, a hundred times, I've heard people say, "Well, well, Tammy may be severely retarded, but she's really smart when it comes to." And then fill in the blank. It's different for different people. Well, everybody is smarter about some things than others. Figure out what those are empirically from being in those situations, from watching, from remembering. And then let's set up more situations that bring out the best in Bryce. The smarts, the helpfulness, the gentleness. Because every person is more gentle in some situations than others. Okay. That's one where I think about in, in the extremes there that uh, somebody who was uh, all time world famous for being gentle, apparently, was St. Francis of Assisi, right? You've read about him. Uh, but I believe that he would probably be the first one to assure you that sometimes he had violence in his heart. So, what situations will bring out the gentleness? no matter who they are, or the opposite extreme. I've met a few people over the years who were famous, statewide famous, for being violent. The way you get to be famous as a, a client of an institution or a human service is to hurt staff. And you'll become famous. Yeah, but even that person, it's just as good a question, actually more important. What brings out the gentle side? Think back over the last week. You know, some of the people in this conversation uh, concerning Bryce, let's say, Bryce was gentle, don't worry about Bryce, but other people, a woman named Deanna, people who were there at that session, who, well, there were several people there who work with her eight hours at a time. When was she gentle? I don't care if it was only 5% of the time, we got to know when that is. What brings out the gentle person, even in Deanna? So what brings out the best? What brings out the worst? You're thinking, you know, when I said that earlier, I said, ooh, that's not nice. Uh, I think that's totally legitimate to ask. We are not asking, what's the bad side of Bryce? I ask no questions about what somebody is like inside, because we can't change that. Okay. But what brings out the not so sharp side? What brings out the short attention span instead of fuller attention span. I mean, that's one of those human service um, assessment mentality uh, mistakes, I think, really in the practical sense is to say, well, uh, Kristen has a attention span of only uh, about two minutes. That's a ridiculous thing to say because Kristen or anybody else can pay attention to some things more than others on average. You can see those patterns. Um, I have the marvelous capacity of being able to pay attention to a Red Sox ball game, even on the radio for three and a half hours or whatever it takes, focused. Some people who have better things to do with their lives <laughs> couldn't pay attention to a ball game unless they were in the park and they still can't. When you go to Fenway Park, you see there are a lot of people there who are more fascinated by the phone in front of them than by the ball game. Well, people are different. And what brings out the good attention span? What brings out the good focus? What brings out the devotion, the attention, the uh, uh, intelligence, the, I mean, it's funny old fashioned words, but what brings out the good character in Bryce? And that may sound judgmental, well, I guess it is, but, but we're not judging Bryce's character. We're judging what situations bring out the better side of Bryce, the side that more people will find him a pleasure to be with. That's gonna be a good thing for us to arrange, isn't it? So there's a long explanation of, uh, of a question that, that sounds simple, but that's one that as conductor, I would keep on pulling on that one. And what else? Okay. And by pulling on it, I mean, you know, and here's sort of like being a good interview of trying to have a good ear for, for when, when to ask for more from the group and to look around and make sure just one person is not the only person answering. Or sometimes there's somebody there like Bryce's mother. People will look to her and think, well, she knows best. Uh, make sure to look around, to give your cues. 
subtle or otherwise, or even to call on people if you have to, but to make sure you get different perspectives because people know Bryce from different angles. Right? So here, here's one example of, of pulling on it, seeking more detail, is somebody will say, I guarantee it, this is, I believe this is a universal, all people love music. I've heard that in every design session when we ask that question, for the last, I don't know, 30 years, I've been asking that question. Uh, what brings out the best in Bryce? And so, oh, he loves music. So I write on the wallpaper, you know, on the uh, easel pad, uh, loves music. Uh, don't just leave it there. <laughs> that, that, that's not that useful as far as what are we going to put in Bryce's life later? All of us, right? And so, okay, like, so what kind? And, and then, you know, 12 more questions if you need to. Although usually you don't need to, once people start specifying, then they'll, they'll build on each other, their experience of Bryce and who he is. So the first big half of the day, which I haven't finished yet, is uh, I like to call the our portrait of Bryce. We're gonna paint a portrait in words uh, of Bryce, people who know him from different angles. And the second big half of the day would be the design, the future, the, right? Okay. But that we've begun to talk about the, the portrait. And portrait, by the way, there's another word that uh, I don't like to call it the profile. I'm thinking even literally in artistic terms, a profile is like a, just a silhouette, right? An outline. We want a portrait. We want it to look like it's three-dimensional or feel like it's three-dimensional, right? Um, and also profile, at least in some human service contexts, is the name of what goes on kind of like just the inside cover of somebody's official case file. Ooh, get away from that when we're doing design sessions. Informalize. We do not want our conversation to be trapped in the categories of service land. We're thinking about a person and the community in which they'll become a part. Okay, so portrait. But I want to stop now. Questions, thoughts, comments on this first big question. What brings out the best in Bryce? Katie. I guess I just have a comment. You know, one thing that I appreciate about how this is structured is the focus really on the, the environments and the context, you know, because those are certainly things that we we have control over it, right? That we can change in our, our support. And I think it is more common to think about, you know, if somebody um, you know, had a bad week or a bad day, but we're not really kind of thinking it out loud and through together, even if it's not a full design session in terms of, well, you know, what, what went well and what brought out the gentle sides or what brings out the best and how do we do more of that and be more deliberate about that and avoid some of those environments that we know uh, aren't, going to bring out the best because it's true for all of us, right? So I, I just really appreciate that context so it isn't so concrete. And I feel like that's a nice way to be able to have that conversation with somebody in the room too. Because um, mm -hmm. like you said, it's nothing yeah. personal. It's really about um, right. the, the, that context. The person is at the center of the thinking, but we're thinking actually and planning the context around them, ironically, yeah. Another question along that line that, that would be, especially if you have a group where this is part of their purpose, that's why they invited uh, to have a, a long conversation, is uh, maybe they're going to think about job possibilities or volunteer job possibilities. Um, and to ask, well, what brings out the good worker in price? What kind of job, in a broad sense, you know, what kind of task, what kind of accomplishment? Right? Because again, people are different. In that way. Is he a good worker? That's the assessment question. Don't ask. What situations bring out the good worker in Bryce? Yeah, even in Bryce, it's happened. Okay. Other thoughts on that big question? And just one point that you made quickly, and I just want to clarify, is that you said something about right in town. So with everybody's answers, you would be, um, if you were in person, right in it down, or even if you were on screen, like facilitated, like everybody's contributions, correct? Yeah. Um, we have a few times. I wasn't sure it was a good idea, but it's worked out actually very well to do it on Zoom. Um, 
and there, usually when I'm conducting, I'm also writing on the easel pad. And of course, that's useless on Zoom. You can't do that. Somebody's got to write it down. So I, you know, will just figure out beforehand uh, and ask somebody, especially if I have a confederate, as they call it in psych uh, research, right? That uh, to have a, a, a pal who is set up beforehand. And if I don't know anybody of among the musicians, then I'll just arbitrarily ask somebody, but to do it before that day. So are you willing to take notes? We did try, by the way, um, having a, an electronic whiteboard, I guess maybe you could call it, or maybe they call it that. Uh, and that was distracting. I, you, you want people to see each other's faces. We're thinking it through out loud together. What, what part of together don't we understand? Don't put a whiteboard in front of people's screen there, is my experience anyway. Other people will disagree, I'm sure. But Rachel. So Jack, I know when Beth Mount does her, her um, design sessions, she focuses a lot on pictures and drawings because she knows that a lot of times the people that we're supporting might not be um, mm -hmm. so great with writing or reading. Have you found that drawing is a useful technique for you or are there, I mean, I know I'm more words-based, but I also wanna make sure that when we're doing this, that we're being inclusive too and accessible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've seen, uh, a few people do it that way. Beth Mount is a natural artist. And so that came naturally to her and she, the, the wall looks beautiful. John O'Brien, who also goes back 40 plus years in, in doing this and has worked very closely with Beth and a little bit with me too. And uh, O'Brien is not a natural artist, but he does find, as you said, that there'll be some people who will relate more to that. And so he makes himself do some little cartoonings, right? I have tried that and I can't make myself do it. I don't have the self-discipline, I guess, but I also don't believe it's necessary um, for two reasons. One may be an unconscious elitism and I'm into words and everybody should be and I'm leaving some people out, which wouldn't be good if that's the case. The other one that's not quite as elitist is, you know, I have been in sessions where the person that we're focusing on is there and they uh, can't read. But they do know that every time their name goes up on an all words, 14 pages full of words, that they are thrilled to know that somebody is writing about them. That, that I think I have seen this in working all these years with people with intellectual impairment, that I think almost everybody thinks there's a kind of a magic in writing, even if they don't, can't, can't follow it. So I don't feel totally guilty about not pictorial. One thing I have tried to do that I think is more important than cartooning is to try to arrange the page somewhat. And so that's using what Beth Mayo calls graphics, not necessarily pictorial, but arrows and, you know, cycles. <laughs> and boxes and, and I think that's a, a good thing to, to try to try to do it doesn't come natural to me I am an English teacher at heart I write in outline form not putting up the Roman numeral but you know superordinate headings and subordinate headings like that and and I find that natural and um, so I hope I'm not leaving some people out, but I think that's a stylistic kind of question rather than an essential question. It is wonderful to watch Beth, but at the end of the day, what, did, what does that say? I don't see that pictures help as a record. Pictures do help as a facilitation technique, as an inviter of people to say more. And so what's happening on the wall or on somebody taking notes? Well, if somebody's taking notes, that's purely a record. It's not part of facilitating. You lose something with that because it, it's harder for people to follow. Doing it on Zoom, I find that the conductor has to more often say, so we were talking about X and what's the next step and Y? Because it's not there coming down the wall. So there are a lot of variations. 
and almost any of them are better than nothing. Thank you. So we'll go ahead. Here's a second big question. And this one too, this is a question. You don't have to be part of a five hour session. This is something that could stand on its own. This one even more than the others, I think. And sometimes uh, here's a question that when I ask it, I say, don't answer this right away. Everybody think for a couple of minutes, silent. What gift does Bryce bring to our world? Now, maybe some people in the world have not noticed that gift and that's their loss. They're not gonna be able to receive it because there's some people who maybe they dismiss Bryce just because of how he looks or the fact that he doesn't speak. But you guys know Bryce. You in the room with us here or on the Zoom with us if it's a design session. You know Bryce and you know, right? What gift does Bryce bring to our world? I think for a couple minutes. And then open it up. And that's the one place actually, I, I, as a conductor, I, I don't try to be too pushy in my cues. Uh, so usually I'll just ask a question and see who responds. And then just maybe look at somebody who's been silent or look away from somebody who's been too dominant, right? Uh, but, so, you know, understated cues, just implicit. But this is the one place where I will actually say, uh, everybody take a turn. I want to hear from each person in Bryce's life. And we'll go, and I'll turn to Bryce and smile and apologize and say, Bryce, you go last. Because I don't want what Bryce says to dampen other people's creativity. You see what I mean? So, and, and then we'll go around the room. Or if it's on, <laughs> if it's on uh, Zoom, then I'll actually call on people one at a time. Katie. What would you say is Bryce's gift, right? And uh, that's an interesting question I find in, in practice, okay? Well, it's not an interesting question. The answers are interesting and people's response, and especially there've been many times that I've asked that, you know, in sort of public situation. There's not always family in every session I've ever done. Most times, frankly, it's been all staff, but when family are there, that sometimes they're overwhelmed, actually. That here are all these people, some of whom they barely know, you know, a new part-time staff member. And everybody sees things in their son that in some cases, they've never thought about that question. What gift does our son bring to the world? He's 18 years old, I never thought of that. I've had several times. Parents have said that. And so it's a really evocative question or a word that doesn't sound as positive, but it, but it is a provocative question. It provokes people. It invites people to think in a different way. And that's a word that is chosen carefully also gifts. Now it sounds similar to, and in other people's steps, they might have a step, something like, uh, and, and years ago, before I changed this, maybe, oh, I don't know, more than 20 years ago, I used to ask with the same idea in mind, I would say, you know, we don't want to just think about Bryce's disabilities. We want to think, what are Bryce's abilities, his capacities, his strengths, his talents, right? is gifts. And I thought of gifts as almost another name for those other things and, and realized that's not necessarily true. Thinking about the meaning, the connotation of these words, that a gift, well, it, that means something. That word is not just random. It's, it, it has a different meaning than ability, let's say. Ability is something that sits inside you. A gift is something you have received and or you can give to others. It's intentional that word choice, because we're gonna be thinking about relationships in Bryce's life. It's just about all we have to go on to help somebody to have a better life. 
It may be a, pre, a small and professional relationship. It may be an intimate family relationship, but, but that, that's where we're going to be working through this band of people in Bryce's life, right? And so um, a gift is a transaction. It's not a possession. So what gift does Bryce bring to our world? And then, you know, people will say his helpfulness or people will say, or, and there was one time that was kind of most dramatic that, you know, very early in, in beginning to ask that question, that I was hesitant, it was at a high school, at Marshfield High School, and the special ed staff, including therapists and aides and so on, right, the special ed class staff were all there in the room. And we were thinking instead of about just one person like Bryce, we were thinking about all of their students. So it was, I don't know, you know, eight or 10 students, something like that. And, and it's unusual. It's not as quite as focused, but it's still a useful thing. I've uh, done that many times too. And so I asked the, was about to ask the question, what abilities do your students have? What abilities, what talents, what gifts, what strengths? You know, because you're asking for things to build on, not just things to remediate, right? I was about to ask that and I stopped myself because I, I caught myself. I, just the day before I had visited there, just so I would, you know, for a few minutes meet the students. And I won't be making the music, but even as conductor, at least there'll be familiar faces vaguely or names when people talk about them. And so I remember back the day before meeting a woman named Stephanie. And Stephanie was, I guess, about the most severely impaired person I ever met. She was blind and deaf and could hardly move. She had like no control over movement. And given all of the above, it's hard to know how well her mind works, but as far as anybody knew, she was you know, profoundly intellectually impaired. And so it like flashed through my mind, luckily, that if I ask what are Stephanie's abilities, people might be thinking, well, none really. You know, what are Stephanie's talents? It's a different question. What gift does Stephanie bring to this world? And the person who the day before I had met, her special ed teacher in her little tiny classroom that's behind the boiler room, you know, that kind of situation that special ed is still in sometimes. And uh, her teacher who had the little tiny class of the three people who with the most severe disabilities, okay? And that teacher, when she had introduced me to Stephanie the day before, she said, oh, and this is Stephanie. She's the lowest of the low. Ooh, I wish she hadn't said that. And so when she was about to open her mouth the next day when we're in the living room and we're having a session together, then, uh-oh, what's she going to say? She said, well, I'm thinking about our student Stephanie and the gift that she brings to the world is the warmth of her smile. And ever since then, that's the only question I ask to try to hear something positive about people. What gift do they bring to this world? And of course, that's also a very useful question as well as you know, kind of an encouraging or heartwarming question, especially for family members, okay, is that's directly useful. Whatever that gift is, then we know that when we get to the second half of the day or the second half of the series of sessions, that we're gonna to have to think of situations where people will receive her gift. Because if we can't invent that in Stephanie's life, and poor Stephanie was stuck behind the boiler room here. Other students at Marshfield High School, they never met her. Well, we're gonna to have to plan otherwise because then it's not a gift, it's a possession. So there's a, a question that maybe it doesn't appear on everybody's ISP or IEP meeting, but I think it's a very good thing for people who know Bryce to get together and, and first silently to reflect on that a little bit okay, and then to share their thoughts. What gift does Bryce bring to the world? Your thoughts, questions, comments? To rephrase something to um, mm. clarify. 
you said this is a question that you would call on each person individually after yeah. they've had some time to think and that if there were family in the room, they would go second to last yeah. to the person being last. So that way they could hear everything else that is, is being yeah. said. Yeah. So nobody, nobody feels like uh, the important people have spoken already. Right. Um, there's a little variation. Uh, you can almost guarantee if you have as many as even just six or eight people answering that question, somebody will say, well, I guess this has kind of been said already. Say it again. Or how would you say it? it it's important that everybody will feel heard on that particular question, I think, especially. Right. So so answering, um, Jack already said what I said, is it? You still want to pull it that right and then get them to to rephrase exactly yeah, how I mean, something right. And this would be sort of generic facilitation skills or interviewing skills, I guess. I don't know. Would be something like, I said, what makes you say that? Hmm. I hadn't thought of this before, but uh, you know, I talked about even at a staff meeting, even in a small session. Well, I guess some of you work for family services that uh, you have occasions where it's just you and the family. And how could that be a bad question to ask the family? Wow. And maybe you do already. So portrait, something that's also often asked in the portrait is just a little bit of a biographical sketch. You know, where has the person lived? I'm thinking about adults now. And especially if somebody grew up at the institution, you know, they're older now. And, and to, to, to hear about, you know, to, to think together out loud, what must that have been like? What must that have felt like? And those are good kinds of questions too, but not kind of the essential. Half. Okay, second half. Um, so another question to ask, the way I like to phrase it, I've got my peculiarities here, is, okay, we've been thinking about a portrait of Bryce, who is Bryce? Now we're gonna think of together about Bryce's future and we're gonna think about situations that would bring out the best in Bryce, just as you were saying, but we're gonna plan those. We're gonna to try to design those together to make some proposals. And I always say to people right at that point, and when we make that big turn into the second half, when we're gonna be thinking in this future, we're gonna be due to some designing together, that um, a couple of things that are important I think to say is, uh, so what we're doing now, what we do now for the next few hours ideally is, is not the plan. What we're doing is one step in a planning process. And so what I'm gonna to try to invite from you would be dozens maybe, <laughs> a bunch of, of proposals, possibilities. We're gonna think of possibilities. And it's a planning process. Now, after today, a few people, maybe Bryce and his mom and dad, maybe one other trusted person, you know, two or three people will make the decision of what you're gonna work on next. And, and that's up to, I mean, ideally Bryce, if he were an adult and able, but that, that's up to the person or, and or their family. Um, but we got a whole gang of people here and let's take advantage of that. And we're gonna elaborate several proposals from among which to decide. And then this will sound surprising, I suppose, maybe, but uh, I think it's essential. And this one, boy, I learned this one from mistakes, is uh, I'll say with that, again, with that little smile and apologetic tone to Bryce, say, now, Bryce, this is gonna sound funny. And, and uh, you know, I've, it's based on my experience. This will be important though. Hope this is okay with you. And then I'll turn back and look at everybody and say, don't ask Bryce if your idea was a good idea. Well, it's a planning process. Bryce will get to, to weigh in and to make the final decision, I guess, really. But, but not today. That why we're here today is to generate proposals. And I have found by <laughs> making this mistake that uh, you know, and it's only natural that you guys care about Bryce. Uh, some of you know him very well, you're nice people. And it seems only polite when somebody says, ooh, ooh, I could imagine maybe Bryce uh, to have some job that's kind of like a park ranger. 
He loves the outdoors, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, so park ranger, and then it's only natural. You turn to Bryce and say, so Bryce, what do you think? Do you like to try that? And Bryce, sometimes think about people who live in service land. Right? And sometimes there are Bryce's of the world who will say something like, well, um, I don't think so. I like doing janitorial work. Not that that's better or worse, but they're saying it because their supervisor in their day program is right there in the room and they don't want them to feel bad. They want to please them, that's nice. Okay, but our purpose today is design. It's not being nice. And so uh, Bryce, hold off your thoughts, right? You'll get a chance you know, tomorrow or next week, or, you know, the, the decision makers will sit down, but we got people here who are not decision makers, but they're idea generators. Let's all do it together. And so don't ask Bryce, and then I'll smile. And that's one that uh, didn't think of that until it went wrong a few times. Um, but now I always say that when we start the second half of the, the, the day. And then the big question which with, I, with which I begin the second half of the day is, okay, everybody, who can you picture that Bryce might become? And, and that again is sort of like unusual wording. And sometimes it's wording that doesn't trip a little human service switch, but instead it sort of forces people to kind of think about it. At least I hope so doesn't force, it invites people, we hope to think about it. And so, uh, you know, who, who could you picture Bryce becoming? And let's say, this one actually did come out for, for Bryce. So somebody did say, uh, Bryce would be great as a park ranger. He's only 17 now, but you know, after more high school and be, begin to get some experience along that line. Now, you don't know Bryce, but even what I've said about him already, he can't speak, right? He, he could walk, but, you know, with, with some difficulty. And so, no, Bryce is not going to be a park ranger. And one thing that I often do at the very beginning of the day is I'll write it as a guideline on the wall. Silly ideas are welcome because there was a reason for that. And let's get behind it, which is not hard to do. People enjoy that. Park ranger, huh? Okay. Maybe somebody else in the room will say, that's not in the cards, although I doubt it. But even if somebody does, then you turn back to the proposer and say, so what about park ranger, right? This is obvious, <laughs> made you think of Bryce being able to uh, you know, do something like that. And it's not hard at all. You don't have to be forceful to invite people to think about something that has a vague resemblance to park ranger. That was what made the guy think of that because he loves the outdoors. Because he walks slowly, but he loves to walk because, because, because that they know Bryce. Right? What can you picture Bryce becoming? And so it's not just picture him doing, but, but becoming. And some of you know from other you know, social role valorization type of training, it focuses on the role. And a role is a context that holds a person, right? becoming, it's not just something you do, it's somebody who, it becomes part of who you are. And so who can you picture Bryce becoming? And then of course you, you get the details, you pull on it and try to not, to, to, to have other people add the details, build on this idea. So yeah, well, where in our town would people do something like that? With whom would, would that role be played? in the future, if we can work toward that too. Um, what kind of supports would be necessary for Bryce to be able to do that? Maybe different from somebody else. And uh, who's gonna follow up, you know, among the group right here, give people homework. You know, who's gonna check into that? When somebody says, well, um, there's uh, an Audubon sanctuary just in our town or two miles from Bryce's house and uh, they always need volunteers and maybe that would be a possibility. So it started with park ranger, wild idea, right? And now it's getting very concrete, very possible. And so, okay, now who's gonna check into that? And don't just look on the website, <laughs> go and talk to somebody at the uh, Audubon Sanctuary. 
to, to give homework. And there's, of course, great advantage of having a series of sessions, or at least of having a, at least one follow-up afterward. As conductor, I am not always invited to the follow-up. I can't say if people uh, put all these ideas into practice. But at least at the proposal stage, you want to get a proposal not just to be a kind of an idea in the air, but then to invite people to concretize it, practicalize it, operationalize it, and then invite people to volunteer for homework. Who's going to look into that? Okay. Like where? Like who does that around here? As well as why is that such a good idea for Bryce, right? And so any example that we come up with, you want to then think about, you know, who might Bryce become? Then to think, well, what, what's going to be our strategy? What could be the steps? What would work toward making that come true? And to make sure to have at least three, I'd say, uh, proposals of who might Bryce become, at least three of those to really play the mood in detail and like a, a practical scenario. Now it's all in the future, it's all hypothetical, but still to make it as concrete as you can, something hypothetical. It, those don't always go together, but it's important to do it there. Who might he become? Example of that recently, we did a, a session over Zoom, the first one over Zoom, and it worked out wonderfully. I was not confident of that. Katie came to those or some of those anyway we did. I, three or four one hour sessions. I hear in this last year and a half, people say all the time that, uh, well, people can't really stay on Zoom for more than an hour. Um, I don't know if that's true, but we accommodated that and we had sessions that were broken out, which means that the conductor is gonna have to do a little bit of, well, remember we talked about and you know, get that ahead. And maybe even to use a, a PowerPoint, just to say, this is what we talked about. But then I would say, you know, take that away, go to gallery. This is interpersonal, thinking it through out loud together, right? So take away the, uh, the screen sharing. But then uh, it was unusual here. We were person-centered planning and the center was Brooke and Sarah, their twin sisters. And they get along fine, <laughs> despite that. Um, they're in their early twenties and they've come out of school and they've started into human service lands. They've started into day programs. And they knew that they wanted something better and maybe even more important, their mom knew that they wanted something that, that was more customized to them. There's another word that I like to use. Person-centered has become a human service land word. Uh, customized, you know what that means for a car or for tailored clothing, right? So this is for you, Brooke and Sarah. And they actually knew what they wanted to become already. So that's, that's not usually the case. That's not usually, you know, that, that they wanted to open a doggy daycare. But I still thought, well, let's go back. And the people who know them, and we had about uh, 15, 16 people on the Zoom gallery to think about what gifts do they bring to the world? Because that will affect how you design the business, even if you know the nature of the business to begin with. And so you could use this kinds of questions, even where you know the answer to part of it already. Well, he's going to be starting a job as such and such. Um, but let's think about on that job, what parts of it would bring it the best? Or let's think about what gifts he brings wherever he goes. And how can we tailor that job to make sure that he has the opportunity? Right? And so uh, for Brooke and Sarah, we thought about then we got into and in anybody's session if you have the time together to go from okay Audubon Sanctuary let's say that's the what, what people put okay who's going to ask who's going to do it and then um, we got in Brooke and Sarah's example more and more detailed just take advantage of having all these good thinking people and good caring people to ask what um what would be the name of the business? And we didn't have a room full of advertising executives, but we had a room full of people. It's like, even as advertising executives, they have focus groups, right, of ordinary people. So, okay, let's push, let's use our imagination. What would be the name? What would be the advertising tagline, you might say? One thing that we determined from that, that I think was significant, it's gonna be a small business. 
it's not going to be how they make their living, most likely, right? I mean, certainly not in the short run, maybe never. They will have human service paid help in order to get it rolling and to run it. Okay. Well, what form should that help take? Let's think that through together. And things like what would be the, the way you would see customers? And we got a year later follow-up just recently. And one thing I was kind of thrilled to, to see is that they have spent zero dollars on advertising. But how do you get people to bring their dog and entrust their dog to these two young women and their helper? Is networks of trust, is word of mouth. And so the word advertising in some places in this world should be abolished and to substitute instead recruiting. That's person to person. And so I was kind of glad to see that it worked out that way. So um, there was an example too of where we got into real detail. What will go on the flyers? What will be the name? How will you hire? What would be the criteria for hiring the uh, 25 hours a week human service paid helper. You don't just take the first person who knows about human services. What do you take? What are you looking for? And what would even be the interview questions that would help you discern, that would help Brooke and Sarah and their mom discern, I think we've got the right person here. And so getting to like exquisite level of detail. If we have time, I think that's always good to do. Here we did have time because some of it was a given, right? And then one other example that I'll, I'll, I'll say, because it was different, it wasn't an entrepreneurship opportunity that we were designing, but you know, more ordinary in human service land. It's a large group home of eight people that was kind of very medically oriented. If anybody's old enough, you may remember the phrase, the acronym ICFMR, kind of a medically designed Medicaid financed eight people. And the people who were the director there and then the exec director over it, they, they could see that this wasn't ideal for people, really. Um, eight people was too many, and most of them, you know, they might need nursing even. They'd have to be a nurse there at all times, but, but to try to get away from the whole place feeling medical, right? And so there was a design session separate ones for each of those eight people. And one was a, a woman named Stephanie, a different Stephanie. But one thing that I remember that was, that was actually really fun, people who knew Stephanie, I just met her for 20 minutes, right? But the people who really knew her every day, including her mom too, to think about the way I phrased it was, if I come back, we're gonna, they're, they're gonna be talking about residential situation. That was the purpose. I'm visiting from Massachusetts here to Denver, New Hampshire, but uh, if I come back in five years, then I visit where Stephanie lives in the home that we're here to begin designing. Then what would Stephanie's bedroom look like? And it was marvelous. All of the staff were women and they all were talking about sort of the beautiful little nice things that they understood as well as they could, Stephanie didn't speak, but what they could discern or they could infer that, well, here's what Stephanie would want. And they, they, they talked about a, a canopy bed, right? With tassels on it, and a four poster, right? And they talked about what would be on the wall. And I'm asking them, concrete, detailed. Now maybe it's not gonna come true in exactly that way, but I still think it's really good for people to use their imagination in a very concrete and customized way. And it was, it was an interesting situation, sort of ironic. So I remember it partly because it was so um, exquisitely detailed. But remember it also because I knew actually very well, was kind of pals with the uh, woman who worked in the group home there. And uh, she, she was involved in staff training kinds of things that I was involved with too. And so Robin uh, gave me an update. Um, five years later, Stephanie had still not moved. And Stephanie, it was a tough situation. There was emergency here. Stephanie had a, I guess a degenerative disease 
uh, might have been multiple sclerosis, something like that, I'm not sure. But, but people were concerned, how long is Stephanie gonna live even? She's in her forties now, but she won't probably live very long. And so five years later and she hadn't moved. And, but then she did move soon after that. And I got another update from my friend, Robin, who said, well, bad news, Jack, that, that Stephanie passed away a few months ago. But the good news is that before she passed away, she moved to her own place with adult foster care kind of situation around her. And that she had a canopy bed and she had beautiful things on her dresser, just like we said. And so what is to become of somebody in the future? No way of knowing. And it has no bearing on what we need to do now is to try as best we can to customize. Now, the last section uh, to, to mention is, so whom should be invited? And you kind of picked this up between the lines already, I guess, that the more variety, the better, because people will know Bryce, go back to him, from different angles. And also um, to invite some people who are outside service land. Yes, family, of course. But people will say family, and that means that, well, they've done you know, a lot of sessions where somebody's mother or mother and father were there. Not very many where Bryce's or the person's brother or sister were there. Every time somebody's brother or sister came, they were, I would say, the most valuable participant. The brothers and sisters of a person with disabilities, of course, they're, they're, they may be anyway, as close as family as parents, but they're different dynamics. You gotta be careful how I say this, but um, parents look at things a certain way, brothers or sisters, it's different. Parents have a certain relationship with staff. It may have been adversarial for decades. Brothers and sisters, not necessarily. And it really was interesting that the brothers and sisters are sometimes are sort of de facto mediators between staff and parents but also they know the person in a different way. Think about your own life if you have brother or sister, right? They know you're different than your parents. You did it that way intentionally, right? So, um, and so invite somebody's brothers or sisters and said so to the extent that if they can't make it on the 14th, then we're gonna change the date to sometime when they can. Um, one person, at least one person in the room, and if somebody's mother can come, it's usually her, but, but if there is somebody in Bryce's life who is kind of like his champion, it's like in the medieval tournament kind of sense, the person who will be the champion of the uh, damsel in distress, that the person who is, is the principal person on their side and willing to speak out and push, obviously make sure they're there, wherever they are. Might be staff, might be former staff, right? Invite them. Um, another element, though, friends of the family. This is unusual. You know, to be honest, usually it was just a gang of staff. They invited me and I told them whom they should invite and there was nobody there but staff. Okay, still worth doing. But to invite friends of the family, sometimes that has also been really marvelous. This man named, uh, lost his name. It wasn't Bryce. Anyway, so his... Uh, his father's golfing buddies were people who knew him in a different way and they were not encumbered by thinking about him in human service categories as we are. Okay. And of course, a way to sort of sum that up, uh, and down in Southeastern Mass, maybe a few of you have met Ed Wilson. He works at regional office, but also Ed has done a, a great deal of person-centered planning design sessions. Uh, worked with him and, and that Ed has a phrase, I just got to give him credit for this. I wish I'd thought of it. He said, if you want to have a group that together is going to think outside the box, you probably want to invite at least one person into the group who doesn't even know there is a box. Ed was interested in good planning for a young man named uh, Scott. Ed was his service coordinator. And so Ed, because he knew Scott, and he knew who knew Scott, he invited Scott's barber to come to the day. And so there are a few people you think of as sort of like offbeat, you would invite them. He 
doesn't really know Scott that well. Well, in a way that's good because he knows a, an element of Scott. And of course a barber shop or a hairstylist kind of shop are in some of them are places of marvelous conversation where people will know the best in Scott, maybe. If they do, invite them. And people often are thrilled to be invited. We explain what it is, why it is, if they can come. And people at first will say, well, you know, I don't really know about disability. They, no, no, that's not where we're inviting you. And people are thrilled to come. There's another kind of an odd invitation. Sometimes we've been able to invite and they've come. Um, not often, uh, the area director, you know, the big shot, right? Or the exec director of the agency. And uh, well, they don't have time to come to every design session. If everybody had one, it's ridiculous, but well, but they don't get invited. They may be thrilled. Uh, somebody that Katie knows well, uh, Beth Moran, we use uh, in the Brockton area, you know, has done that a couple of times. And she's thrilled once in a great while to be able to leave the paperwork beside, leave the budgets aside, right? And come and focus all day on one person is actually an exciting thing for people to be able to do. So variety. And then one last kind of a odd job description or would be to invite somebody who's an expert in Bryce's community. They've never even met Bryce, but maybe there's somebody who works at town hall for the last 30 years. And they think Bryce was from Northboro, that Northboro is the greatest place in the world. And they think everybody should want to live in Northboro and become part of everything in Northboro. Perfect, that's who we want to come. And also, of course, they will have information when somebody were, were assigning homework and somebody says, well, the, the Audubon Society, and they say, oh yeah, I know the person who runs that and they'll give the phone number right there on the spot inviting somebody who's an expert in community, because that's one of the places that we're almost always going to be going, is how, who might Bryce become in relation to parts of his community together. So, sorry, I left less time for questions than I meant to, but I'm not going anywhere. Anyway, so comments, questions, thoughts, reflections, please. Don't make me call on you. Hi, Jack. Um, I intend to use this with a person who grew up in the foster care system. Mm. She doesn't have um, a DDS label or anything, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's painfully obvious to me that she has not had um, a whole lot of opportunity mm. to focus on her own self ever. Yep. She, there's very little in her life that I can see that brings her any happiness except cats. Um, she's very medically compromised and what I'm trying to do, I think I'm gonna use some of these things. Um, I don't think anybody has ever really asked her what does she wanna do with her life? Mm -hmm. um, when I proposed that to her, when I first met her, um, I said, well, so, so what do you want to do moving forward with your life? You know, how can I help you as your social worker, get the things that are going to make, you know, allow you to move forward. Once we tackle all the stuff that you need immediately, she has no future thoughts. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't dawn on her what the next 30 years of her life are going to look like. She's, um, early fifties. So it's, it, how do you help somebody who doesn't know what they want mm -hmm. or has never even um, been given? I don't even know what to, I don't even know. I'm, I'm, she's so sheltered in her whole, her world is just so all about um, her medical conditions and her cats. And there's nothing else in her life. Uh, how, mm -hmm. how do I move her forward in even trying to think about what she might want? Because it doesn't even sound like she knows she, she has no way of knowing. It's yeah, odd. some people, there, there are two things going on in the lives of people that we support. One of them is for many people that they have a impairment, disability, and it may be a mental impairment. That's not your situation now, Tammy, but uh, you know, for many people who are thinking about it, that 
the future is in the nature of it abstract, right? And some people may have trouble thinking about the future for, for that reason, that their mind doesn't work well that way to, to abstraction. Um, but Tammy, the person you're talking about, that's not the problem, probably. The, the problem is nobody ever asked her. Maybe or pretty close to it, right? And so future is not in her repertoire to be thinking about. Now, I think, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't tried it, but <laughs> I think any of these questions could just be the two of you. And for you, of course, you should be good at this, right? <laughs> to be very welcoming, very soft, very encouraging, very not in a hurry, very patient, uh, very, you know, pose a possibility in such a voice that it doesn't sound like you're telling her what to do and to say, hey, what about, right? So, so using it just two people. Now, if there's anybody in her life who would be an ally in that conversation, that's, that's much better. They may not be. Because the second problem that people have is not disability. The bigger problem is having been devalued by their society, having been dismissed, left out. And uh, I've never worked in that system, but from what I hear that there, there are a lot of people who have been in 10 and 20 foster homes. And so, uh, wow, if there's anything worse than growing up at a scummy place like Denver State School, then uh, that, that, that might be it, right? So, so it would be fascinating to think about her past, but probably it may be useless, so I don't know. See, I'm not a psychoanalyst, right? I think it would be useless <laughs> at best, but it would be good to sort of put those out somehow as evocative questions that things that she'll say and tentative things that you'll say would kind of float in the air for her to, to which to respond. I'm kind of making this up. I haven't thought about that, but those are mine. Quick thoughts, anyway. I think it's common, though, uh, Tammy. You know, unfortunately, for for many people that we are providing supports for, that they've had um, limited experiences, right, or limited opportunities. So it's how do you have a vision when you don't know what the possibilities are? So that's one of the powers I think of having a planning session and having people that can think outside of maybe. Um, the box of what they've been provided as far as programs or services and just to really start to think and lean into again that that belonging in that community like Jack was talking about and starting to think about you know who who do we know who do I know um, who might she know or, or get to know that also lives in the community and shares some of these um, interests right and and trying to find those those places and spaces so I like how you tied that up at the end, Jack, and really was, you know, bringing it back to, again, who do we know that somebody could connect to there or share that role with um, and really kind of bringing it back to, again, not just a, a new possibility, but a new possibility to connect and to belong and to really become, you know, in, in terms of relationship um, with others as well. I think it prompts me to answer a different question. This isn't what you asked, but I'm, I'm reminded of it that, that some people would feel uncomfortable. And I guess it's good to feel uncomfortable, but we can't let that stymie us. That there are some people with intellectual impairment, very severe. They can't speak. As far as we know, they don't know what in the world I'm talking about. They can't join the conversation. Not in words, not in sign. This is not many people, but at least at... at um, Northern Bristol Arc, you, or Bristol Arc, you know people, some of the people you support, right? That uh, through families or in group homes and so on. And so some people would say, well, like, you know, we, we can't ask the person, so we, we really shouldn't like talk about them. I think that's a big mistake. I think that's selling people short. <laughs> I know there may be even some of you who, who feel this is a matter of rights. And I don't look at it this way. I look at what's going to be the best possible life situation for somebody. And if the five of us don't get together and, uh, and, and ask each other, what can we picture that would be best? It, we, we can't wait for this person to say what she thinks would be best. It's not going to happen. 
And so I, you can hear it in my voice. I get a little bit impatient with people who are kind of I'm not sure. I think they're, they're hardliners on a, a rights orientation, which is not my orientation, actually. It sounds odd. It's not that I'm opposed to human rights. It's just that that's not how I'm looking at this whole equation. That, uh, you know, customizing somebody's life situation, not what's inside them, but their life situation, and getting a band of people who give a darn about them at least a little bit, I think that's even more important if the person can't join the conversation. I'll say something intentionally obnoxious to Rachel there that's, uh, I don't believe in self-advocacy, I'm opposed to it. I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but I believe in people working on it together and leaning onto each other, no matter their abilities or inabilities. I agree, but that should be including the person with the disability <laughs> because oftentimes it's people advocating on their behalf without them being involved. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? I know we're over time. So. Well, thank you, Jack. And, and thank you for uh, your listening and contributions. I know our group got smaller as we went on, but I, I, I certainly got a lot, a, a lot out of it as usual. If anybody has questions or things that percolate or come up, you know, feel free to reach out to myself or Jack and we'll be happy yeah. to talk things through out loud together.